Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Calvary Chapel, San Ramon Valley, the YouTube channel. We are going to continue our study through the book of 1 Peter today. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up. 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be, continuing to pick up where we left off last week in this incredible study through this incredible book. But I want to open up like this. I want to, I want to share a story with you that is an incredible illustration about who we are called to be and how we can value others. So listen to this story. It goes like this. A Dutch bicycle manufacturer called Van Moof, true story, true company, has come up with an ingenious idea for ensuring that its product is safely transported to its customers. Here's what they did. Van Moof, after setting a goal, to sell 90% of its bicycles online by 2020, they started seeing a considerable number of products getting damaged during delivery. And they started incurring some serious losses. So it, this put the company in a pickle. What were they going to do? They really felt they were left with two options. Number one, completely reinvigorize their business plan, no more online sales, or number two, they need to come up with a solution to try and fix all the damage that they were incurring. So here's what they did. They managed to come up with an idea so brilliant that it's going to be copied by other companies who, who rely heavily on online sales. So here's what they did. They decided, they, they noticed that their boxes with their bicycles were about the same size as a really, really, really massive flat screen TV. And upon doing some research, they discovered that flat screen televisions almost always arrive in perfect condition. So what they decided to do was, what if they said, we just printed the image of a flat screen TV on the outside of our box with a bicycle on the inside? And that's what they did. And after doing that for one year, they realized, they actually didn't realize, they noticed that their, their, their damage was reduced by 75%. Think about that. They solved their problem by eliminating the, the damage to their items by 75% simply by putting the image of a TV on the outside of their bicycle boxes. But what did they discover? What is it true for us? What's our applicational point? Here it is. When we value what's inside the box, we will treat the box itself with greater care. When we see what's inside and we view it as fragile or valuable, we're going to be nicer by the way we handle it. All the different hands that those would pass through, they all treated it with better care when they thought it was a TV. And here's kind of more of that connection is putting something valuable, putting the image of something valuable on the outside of a box was not Van Moof's first idea. Do you know who came up with that idea first? God did. God did. Listen to this. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created them, mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Think about that. God put his image on the outside of our box, in a sense, on the outside of you and I. Every single human being is an image bearer of God. We bear his image. And not only that, that box. We have the
image of God. How are you? Because we value what are. They are valuable. You. got the price to dying. This is how we should see the people around us. And with that in mind, I want you to see that because Peter tells us it's how we can show value, how we can treat them with a greater. So listen to what he said. Peter chapter verses 8 through 17. Let's read it first. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having come Passion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Listen, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil." Pray with me. We'll get into our Bible study. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And as we let your word wash over us and we consider the way that you want us to conduct our lives, the way you want you, your people, us as Christians, believers, followers, disciples, to show those with greater care, to show those around us that we value them because you value them. Father, there's a list of 10 things that you've just shown us in your word. And we pray that we would turn our ears to hear what you have to say, that we would bend our lives to what your word declares to us, that we would submit ourselves to your word under the authority of your word. And so Father, come and and speak to us as we conversate about this, as we dig into your word. God, anoint my lips to preach to your people in a way that is honorable, faithful, accurate, and true. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, notice the first word, that we have here. The first word Peter says is finally, finally. And the word finally means to sum it all up or in conclusion to everything that he's been telling us throughout this letter. Really though, in in, in chapter two as a whole, all the different areas that Peter has been calling us to walk in faithfully, all the different things that he's been saying, you've been born again to do this. You've received the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. As we read, you're called to this. This is what it's supposed to look like. What we're really looking at here this morning, if I can sum it all up, and I have, if I can put a title on this, it's this, this is our to-do list. Christians, this is our believers' to-do list. Finally, here's our marching orders. Here's what it looks like in 10 practical things, 10 commands that we're supposed to apply to our lives and obey. But remember, this this is who we've been born again to be. This is who we've been made alive to be. This is who we've received the Holy Spirit, been empowered to be, to reflect Jesus in these ways. This is what it's supposed to look like as we trust him and follow him. Listen, even in suffering, even in persecution, even through trials and difficulties, this is what it's supposed to look like. So remember that Peter's writing to Christians in the first century who are under Emperor Nero, who's a madman. And Peter's still writing and saying, this is what you're called to do. This is what it's looked like. 10 things are on our to-do list this morning. So finally, he says, all of you, and and we want to know, is any of us excluded from that? 
No, all of you, he says. All means all, and that's all, all means. So it means you, and it, it means me. It means all of us. And I want you to know this situation isn't talking about only in the context of with another Christian. This is talking to us as Christians. This is what we're called to do, regardless of if it's going to be reciprocated, regardless of how we're going to be treated. We can't control somebody else. But as far as me and my house, this body, we're going to serve the Lord. And this is what it looks like. So 10 things. The first thing he says, he says, be of one mind. And I'm using it to say point number one is be harmonious together. As much as it depends upon you and I, be in harmony with the other Christians around you. We're not going to be able to be in harmony with people who don't yet know Jesus. But when we are in interaction with other Christians, be harmonious. And, and what that means is if you've ever heard a, a worship team singing a worship song and, and you've got multiple different instruments and you've got multiple different vocalists, and they all have different gifts, but they're singing the same song. And they may be singing at a different note, but it's in harmony. It's beautifully mixed together where it sounds pleasant. That's the way he's saying you and me, believers, we can live, ought to live in harmony together. How are we going to do that? Because we can recognize we have different gifts, but they come from the same spirit. We have different passions, but the same main passion to see Jesus glorified to see people get saved. That's got to be the main thing, right? The main, main thing. We have other different things that we're passionate about, but we can all align ourselves under. We want Jesus to be glorified, magnified, high and lifted up, and we want to see people get saved. We should all agree on those two things. And when we have those two things in common, we have enough in common. We already have enough in common. We don't need to get hung up on the things we don't have in common. We can keep those things in common. And that's why he says, be of one mind, be harmonious. And you may be thinking, okay, I'll, I'll try that. But whose mind? My mind? No, not my mind. Not your mind either. Whose mind? The mind of Christ. Listen to what Paul says. Philippians 2 verses 1 through 4. Paul, the apostle Paul says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship in the spirit, any affection and mercy, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others as better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And you continue to read through Philippians chapter 2, you're going to see that's what Jesus did. Clothe yourself with the mind of Christ. Whose one mind are we both called to have? The mind of Jesus. Not my mind, not your mind, the mind of Christ who did all of these things, humbled himself, valued others as greater than himself, tried to live in harmony with as many people as he could. He couldn't. Some people were going to choose to contend against him. They weren't going to be harmonious. But listen, it was their problem. It wasn't Jesus' problem. He had made every opportunity for people to live in harmony with him. And that's, that's got to be our heart. That's got to be all, our call. That's what Peter says. All of you, all of us value e each other. Recognize that we're image bearers of God. We have the price tag worth dying for everybody does. So they're worthy of great care. They are, they are, every human being is. So let's show them that, respect each other, have the mind of Christ. Let Jesus be our main thing, our commonality and being more like him, our greatest goal. How do we do that? Practically, Peter is just getting started. The second thing he says is, is be compassion. He says, having compassion for one another. And that word compassion, it's a word that comes from two different Greek words. Peter uses two different Greek words and he combines them to give us this definition for compassion. And, and what it means is to be affected by what somebody else feels. That's what it means to have compassion, to be affected by what somebody else feels. It means that we are trying to have sympathy stirred up in our hearts so we can respond in sensitivity towards what someone else is going through. It's having compassion. It's seeing and hearing what somebody else is going through and not saying, stinks to be them. Oh, I bet they deserve that. We'll figure it out. Like it's, that's that's non-compassionate. And I want to tell you this. Listen, Jesus has compassion. Do you know this? Lamentations, I put, this, I put the verse in your study. Lamentations 3, it says that our God, his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. 
Do you know that the God we serve, the God we worship, the God who's redeemed our hearts, he has unlimited compassion. It never fails. God never has a lack of compassion, which means neither should we. We should have compassion. Jesus, Jesus is going to see the multitudes and he's going to see them like sheep scattered without a shepherd. And you know what's going to be said of Jesus? Jesus, the rock of ages. We read in 1 Peter, the chief cornerstone, the most important stone, the immovable one. He is going to be moved with compassion when he sees people scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus, our Jesus, he's going to clothe himself in humanity. And one of the things he does is he's walking amongst the world that he created is he's doing that to experience what we experience. So he can be our high priest who sympathizes with our every weakness. Think about that. Jesus, our God and Father, has compassion, which means you and I, Christians, we have compassion. We are to be people who have compassion. If you're looking around at people and you're scoffing at them and you're looking around at people and you're saying, man, they deserve that. Listen, maybe they do, but that doesn't mean we can't have compassion. It doesn't mean we can't try. We shouldn't try to look at things from their perspective, to try and say, I want to see what's affecting them and I want to feel it as if it were me. I want to have compassion. I want to try and enter into their life so I can respond to them with sensitivity I don't want to be a, someone who is a respecter of persons or only judges from the outside. I want to say, Spirit of the living God, give me discernment. Give me compassion for the people that are around me so I can respond to their needs with sensitivity, so I can inject you, Jesus, the one who can cure all ails into their situation. Christians, listen, it is a sad thing when you and I, as Christians, as the church, lose compassion for people. We don't want to lose compassion for people. Let's not let this world and all of the different things that are going on in this world harden our hearts. Let's not let our love grow cold. We're going to talk more about that in a minute because the next thing Peter says is be loving. So be of one mind, be harmonious, have compassion, be compassionate. And then he says, he says, love as brothers, have brotherly love is literally what he's saying. Be loving. It comes from the word Philadelphia, and it means to have a brotherly love, a sisterly love, have something beyond just acquaintances or friendships or distant relatives. Have a bond in love, a friendship that goes deeper than just our commonality, but to the blood of Jesus that has made us brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about what, what Jesus says in John 13, 35, a perfect contextual verse that I think Peter's remembering as he writes this. Jesus says, John 13, 34 through 35 says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. We think about that. Jesus is already quoted earlier in the gospel of John talking about what the two greatest commandments are, right? Love the Lord, your God, your heart, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, now towards the end of the gospel of John, he says, a new commandment I give you, you love one another. Love one another. This world is going to know we are disciples of Jesus by our love one for another. You ever wonder why did Jesus have to give us a new commandment to, to specify who we're to love, loving one another as we have been loved? Maybe because he knew, of course, because he knew how hard it was going to be, how difficult it was going to be for us to actually do it. It's getting harder and harder, isn't it? It's getting harder and harder for us to cut through all the nonsense to love people as we have been loved because there's a whole lot of nonsense, isn't there? But Jesus knows what he's doing. And I want, to challenge, I want to challenge you specifically. I've been challenged by this. But I want to challenge you specifically. Many of us are rightly looking and seeing the times and the seasons. We're, we're seeing things on this rapid descent. We're seeing the things that Jesus said would happen in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24 and 25, this is, it's called the Olivet Discourse. We recorded it. We, 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 we taught through this. You can go look at the archives on our website. It's, it's all there in greater detail. But what Jesus taught about there, he's, he's directly answering the questions in a private discussion with his disciples, the 12, who've asked him, Jesus, what will the signs be as your second coming approaches? What will the world look like as the end of the age approaches? And Jesus gives in great detail through two chapters what it's going to look like. And many of us were rightly, 
watching. We're ready. And I commend you for that. You're seeing things are lining up. There's deception. There's wars and rumors of wars. There's famine. There's pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And we're seeing the frequency of things lining up. We're in, the, we're in a pandemic, right? We're seeing things that we haven't seen things in our entire life. And we're seeing them right now. We're living in them. But I want to remind you of something. When Jesus is talking about the times and the seasons in Matthew 24, he specifically says, no one knows the day or the hour. He says, not even the angels, but my father only, Jesus says. So all of those signs and all those timings and when that day is going to come, it's in the father's hands. It's in the father's control. So again, I commend you, be watchful, be ready, be found faithful. But all those things about the timing, that's in God's control. But here's what's in our control. Here's the point that I'm going with. In that same Olivet Discourse, Jesus says this too is going to happen. Listen closely, this too. He says, many will be offended in that day. Are you seeing people being offended in a greater frequency than ever before? Listen, I am. He says, many will betray one another. Are we seeing betrayal ramping up? And then he says, many will hate one another. Jesus says this, because lawlessness will abound. Listen, the love of many will grow cold. And Christians, I'm begging you as Peter begged you earlier in this same book. I beg you as pilgrims and sojourners, as followers of Jesus, don't let your love grow cold. Don't let your heart get hard as you're seeing all of these different things that are going on. That's in our control. I can say, Lord, I want to have a soft heart. I don't want this to be said of me. I want to, as much as it depends upon me, I want to be harmonious with people. I want to have compassion for people. I want to love one another as Jesus has called me to love. Our greatest commonality is the fellowship we share in the gospel. If we have Jesus in common, we have greater things in common than we don't. And we need to see that and we need to keep that as our main thing. If Jesus' word is the highest standard and the greatest influence in our life, if Jesus' spirit, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the still small voice is the voice we're giving the most attention to, we will continue to love each other. But when we're pouring in too much worldly wisdom, worldly news, worldly influence, you know what's going to happen is we're not going to have compassion for people anymore. And we're not going to love them. And what really happened is we're going to have our love grow cold. And so I'm begging you, please see what the word of God has to say. See it as a to-do list. It's a to-do list for me. Love one another. Love one another. Point number four on our to-do list is be tender-hearted. Look at what he says. Be tender-hearted in verse eight. And the best way to understand what tender-hearted means is it's being the opposite of hard-hearted. It's the opposite of having a cold, dark, hard, calloused heart. In the Roman world, when Peter's writing this letter, when Christianity is, is being birthed because Jesus has crucified, been crucified on a cross, resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and the church is birthed. You know that Roman world? It was cold, and it was dark, and it was hard-hearted. But when Jesus comes on the scene, when Jesus starts birthing his church and launching out the gospel message, a new covenant, you know, one of the tenets of the new covenant is I'm going to take out your heart of stone and I'm going to put in a heart of flesh. I am going to tenderize your heart. I want to make you soft. I want to make you sensitive. I want to make you receptive. That's what Jesus does. A tender influence upon the people who become his followers. And that was not a popular thing in the Roman world. That was not an attribute that was to be esteemed. And it doesn't seem like it is one in our era either. Our world is growing cold and dark and hard. And Christians, that is not who we are. We are called to be tender hearted. So even when we're seeking to bring Jesus into a situation and love others, and maybe we're being taken advantage of, maybe we're being rejected or marginalized or cast off or made fun of, That wound, it hurts. All of us, we experience that hurts. But don't let that hurt get scar tissue over the top of it and then become hard so your heart is impenetrable. Don't let your heart get hard. I'm telling you, I've been told so many times since I've been in this Bay Area, if you're going to be a Christian up here, you need to have some thick skin. You ever been told that? You ever been told that you need to have some thick skin? If you're going to walk with Jesus in the Bay Area, you need to have thick skin. Have you ever heard that or wherever you're at? Listen, that's terrible counsel. That's terrible counsel. That is 
that is completely unlike who Jesus is and what he modeled for us. Jesus, on the night that he is betrayed in that garden of Gethsemane, remember his skin is so soft that the capillaries beneath his skin are literally bursting and he's sweating great drops of blood. That's how soft our Jesus is on the day that he's betrayed. He didn't have a hard heart. He didn't have thick skin. You know what he shows us instead? The better way is to have a well-worn path to the throne of grace. When it hurts, you go pray. When it hurts, you go pray. When you need healing, you go pray. When you're struggling with lack of compassion, you go pray. When you're struggling to love people, you go pray. And you ask for love and compassion and to stay tender-hearted to love the people as Jesus modeled for us to love the people. I don't want to have thick skin. And I don't want to counsel you to have thick skin either. Have a well-worn path to the throne of grace, a place that you frequent often in prayer to have God heal our hearts, tend to our wounds, be our wonderful physician. But keep me soft. I want to be tender-hearted. We've been called to be tender-hearted. If you need to have your heart softened this morning, ask God, soften my heart. I am hard towards people. I'm responding harshly towards people. I don't have compassion. I don't have love. You ask God to soften your heart. He will do that. You ask him. Number five, he says, be courteous. Now this is just kindness. This is friendliness. This is common courtesy. I want to ask you, how uncommon is common courtesy in this day and age? It seems like such a fleeting thing. Just listen to some of these basic things. These are common courtesy things. To say hello to the stranger. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time some stranger said, hello, hi, just hello. It's common courtesy to show respect for all people. To not interrupt when someone else is in a conversation. To take accountability and apologize when you've done something wrong. Come on, you do something wrong. You're a knucklehead. You're like, I I screwed up. You know what you should do? Apologize, take accountability, recognize it, own it, and apologize, common courtesy. When your plans change, communicate with the other people involved in those plans. It's common courtesy. Be on time. But listen, not too early. You get invited somewhere for dinner. You don't need to show up a half hour early. They're still cleaning the house. They're still getting ready. They don't need you there a half hour early, right? Be on time. Be punctual. Say please and thank you. Good morning. Good night. Goodbye. Smile. Make eye contact. Listen. Do what you say you're going to do. Let your yes be yes. Clean up after yourselves. Open doors for people. Compliment others for a job well done. Write a thank you note or an email or place a phone call for someone who's gone out of their way to do something nice for you. Be courteous. Christians, you and I, we should be the leading edge of this. We should be people who are kind and friendly and courteous because we know that's the way our God and Father has seen us. That's why he sent his son to die for us, to redeem us. He took the first step. We can take the first step. It's one of those things that we do and we do things like this. Even though they're fleeting in our culture, they start opening up conversations to tell people about Jesus. Man, you're kind. Man, you're friendly. Where do you get that from? And you can point it back to Jesus. We'll see him in being ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Now, we have only been in verse 8. We've talked about all these things half hour into this message. We're only through verse 8. We could have stayed there a lot, but let's move on. Verse 9 says, Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing. Point number six on our list of top 10 or or to-do list, number six on our to-do list is be more like Jesus. Now, yeah, that probably could be number one, right? And it should be number one. It could be number one and number six, but we definitely want to make sure it's on our to-do list. Be more like Jesus. And, And you know what Jesus did? He didn't return evil for evil. Instead, he returned blessing for evil. He was treated with evil, and he blessed in return. And that's what we're called to do. But, but church, I just want you to think about this. Christians, I want you to think about this. In this world, in the situations we face in our lives, we can respond in one of three ways. One of three ways. What, what we can, number one is we can return evil for good. Somebody did something good to us, we can return it with evil. And you know what, that, you know what that's called? That's called satanic. That's the way the adversary, the enemy of our souls, that's the way he responds. He takes what God does as good and he twists it and he corrupts it and he returns evil in exchange. When someone does something good to us and we do evil in return, 
That's satanic. We don't want any part of that. Or number two, we can return good for good and evil for evil. Someone does something good to me, I'll give you good in return, but you treat me bad. I'm not going to treat you good. I'm going to treat you bad. You know what that's called? That's called humanistic. That's just a human level. That's the way every other human being functions in this world, right? You, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your, your back. You take care of me, I'll take care of you. Good for good, evil for evil. But there's a third way, and this is the way Jesus did it. When we are treated in an evil way, we can return for blessing. When treated poorly, we can respond in a favorable way. This is what Jesus taught us. This is what Jesus modeled for us. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? Good for good, bad for bad. But he says, but I say to you, don't resist him who is evil. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. This is returning good for evil. And that's what Jesus did. God has a way. Church, we know this. The Bible is full of examples like this, that even what man intends for evil, God wants to use us to work out for good. That's the story of Joseph's life. Go back to the book of Genesis and read about Joseph and all the evil things that people brought against him, his own brothers. But then all the false accusations because what man intends for evil through Joseph's life and Jesus' life, God can still work for good. And he wants to use us to be a part of that good that he wants to do. But taking a step back just a little bit further, I want you to think about this. What if we don't do this? What if we respond to evil with evil? You know what, ultimately what we've done? We've just made more evil in the world. If we as Christians, we as believers respond to evil with evil, all we've done is increased evil. And we don't want to do that, right? We, don't, we want less evil, not more. And so if we can be a part of the solution, as we're called to be a part of the solution, how do we get less evil? We bless instead of returning evil. We return evil with good. And that's what Jesus did. That means somebody has to deal with it. Somebody has to say, I'm not going to keep spinning this wheel of evil. I'm going to break the chain and do the opposite. I'm going to bless when you treat me that way. I'm going to pray for those who spitefully use me and abuse me. I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we're called to do. Peter says, look at verse 9, knowing that you were called to this. Don't look at me with a sideways look or the TV. This is what Jesus, this is what the word of God says. And so we're saying, this is what it says. I want to obey. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and respond this way. I want to put on the full armor of God and respond this way. I want to stop spinning that wheel of evil. I want to stop the chain and I want to absorb that temporarily to where I can take it to the cross. Jesus, who, he who knew no sin, absorbed all the sin of the world and nailed it to that cross where it was paid for in full. If we model after Jesus, somebody says, I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it to the cross. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He's going to repay. Nobody gets away for anything, but it's not my job to enact vengeance. I'm going to bless. I'm going to let the Lord do what he's going to do. That's what we're called to do. That's responding in a Christ-like manner. Don't return insult for insult. Don't return slander for slander. Don't return evil for evil. We don't want more evil. We want less. So bless Be a blessing, Christian. Let's be compassionate and tenderhearted, courteous. Let's be like Jesus and love even when this world treats us us the way it treated him. We're in good company. Let's be faithful. Verse 10 says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter's quoting from Psalm 34 here, a Psalm of David. And David is penning this Psalm when he's on the run from King Saul. King Saul is throwing spears at David. King Saul is trying to kill David. And what David says is, hey, you know what I didn't do? I didn't even let deceit leave my lips. I didn't even want to speak evil against the Lord's anointed. He says, you want to have long life and have good days? Even if he says, don't do that. 
Learn to refrain your tongue from speaking evil. Number seven, restrain your tongue from speaking evil. I want you to think about this tongue, the words that we speak, these lips. I want you to think this tongue is the only instrument in our body that's been given its own cage. Think about that. Our teeth are a cage for the tongue because we need to be wise about when we're letting it out. We need to be wise about what are these words going to be about? Listen, I, I want you to think about this. We have a dog. We have a German Shore Pointer. And this is dog. He's amazing. I, I love him. But as he's, as he's kind of maturing, he's kind of feeling him, himself out a little bit. There's been a couple times where he's seen another male dog. He's not aggressive. But he'll sit there. And the hair on his back will stand up. And he's just like, are we going to do this? What's going on? He's like, ready. And I want to I tell you this. When you're in that moment and the hair on the back of your neck is standing up, and you're about to post that post. Your flesh is rising up. You're, I'm going to let this person know what's going to happen. I'm going to post this post. I'm going to make that phone call. I'm going to send that email, whatever it is. I need you to ask yourself, you need to think about this. Is that evil or is that a blessing? Is what I'm about to do evil or is it a blessing? Is it going to build someone up or stir someone up or encourage someone up or lead them closer to Jesus? Or is it going to tear them down? Listen, Christians, we need to take a moment and think about what we should refrain from. Peter says, put it on your to-do list. Refrain from speaking evil. Refrain from leaving, from letting something evil leave your lips. Christians, we need to do, we need to bridle the tongue, James would say. And he would say it's impossible, which means we need the Holy Spirit to help us bridle our tongue. We need to keep our tongue in its cage far more often. I want you to think about this. How many times in your life, it happens both ways, but how many times in your life do you say, man, I regret saying that versus, man, I, I regret not saying that. Listen, it happens both. There's plenty of times I, I, I regret not saying what I should have said, but most of the time I still have an opportunity to say it. But when I regret what I did say, there's no way for me to put those words back in my mouth. They're out there and words cut and words stick with people for a lifetime. Proverbs 18, 21 says, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or they're fruit. And he says, you choose. And we do every single time we let this tongue out of its cage and we speak words. Refrain from speaking evil. Christians, we're called to this. Be courteous, be kind, be loving, be more like Jesus and learn to refrain from saying everything you think you need to say. Some people have something to say. Some people just want to say something. Let's speak when the Spirit of God has given us something to say. And let's listen a lot more. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. It's something that needs to be on our to-do list. Come on, speak less evil. Speak no evil. That should be on our to-do list for all of us. He also says, seek peace and pursue it. And when I think about this, this whole idea of peace, Jesus in that great Sermon on the Mount Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. Think about that. Blessed are the peacemakers. They are the sons and daughters of God. And that's who we are, right? As followers of Jesus, we've been brought into God's family. We are sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus, which means by definition, we are the peacemakers. I want to ask you again, if not us, then who? When we, when we look around this world, if there's a situation, we're in conflict with someone, there's tension, who's supposed to be the peacemaker? Christian, if not us, then who? We're the ones who knows the author of peace. We're the one who know the prince of peace. We're the ones who have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Guarding our hearts and mind in Christ Jesus, you and I have peace with God and peace in God. So that means if not us willing to make peace with other people, then who? Christians, this is our responsibility. We are the sons and daughters of God. We should be those peacemakers as, as much as it depends upon us. And it doesn't always. Live at peace with all people. Another thing I just want to challenge you, I'm being challenged in this. Will you take a minute? Maybe the Spirit of God has already put someone on your heart. I want you to ask yourself, who should I, who am I called to seek and pursue peace with? Who's that person that we are at odds Who's that person that when I see them unexpectedly in the coffee shop, I'm like, oh, they're here. Ugh. Who's that person? That's how you know you have peace with them is when you see them unexpectedly and you don't have anxiety in your heart. Listen, a lot of people think that when I make peace with people that we're going to hold hands and we're going to skip and sing songs as we, as we walk through the fields again. That may not be the case. 
Remember Jacob and Esau, brothers who were not at peace. They reconciled and then they went their own way, but they had peace. We need to come and make peace. There's people in our lives that we have let things go way too long. And Christians, it's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to seek that peace. Humble ourselves and clothe ourselves in the humility of Jesus. Have that one mind. But seek and pursue. Peter uses Greek words that there's going to be some effort. Seeking is effort. Pursuing is effort. But that's our call. Seek to win peace back in some of those relationships. You ask the Lord to show you who that person is, what that situation is. But I want to encourage you, be obedient. Put it on your to-do list. Seek and pursue peace with that person, with those people, with that relationship. And let the Lord show you what he's able to do. You're the peacemaker, Christian. If not us, then who? It's our responsibility. It's our call. It's our, it's our gift of the ministry of reconciliation that he's done in us. Verse 13 says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Peter's asking a rhetorical question here in verse 13. He says, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of the Lord and, and do good? If, if you're letting these things be your to-do list and you're about these things, he says, who's going to harm you? And listen, it's a rhetorical question. Notice he doesn't say who's going to hurt you. He says, you're, you're just going to be suffering. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be difficulty. But he, when he says harm, he says, who is going to harm you in a lasting way? Who's going to harm you in a way that is going to leave real and lasting damage? And it's a rhetorical question because he ultimately says no one. Nobody is going to step in front of our inheritance that we have through faith in Jesus. Nobody's going to take away our salvation. Nobody's going to come in and inflict something in us that is going to cost real, lasting, eternal damage. There's going to be some momentary light affliction that is going to be making way for an even heavier weight of glory on the other end. But that's what he's saying. He's inferring that nobody, nobody. And we say, why? Well, how can that be? Listen to what Paul has to say about this. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Listen closely. Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? He says, As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the facts. That's the truth. Nothing is going to separate the love that we have in God through faith in Jesus. And so the point that Peter is making because of all this is he says, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't live your life in fear. Don't live your life paralyzed by anxiety. Don't be so troubled about these temporary, temporary things. Be as convinced, as persuaded as Paul was. That even when we suffer, even when we're hurt, even when we feel rejection, even when we're in distress or famine, None of those things has the power to separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus. None of those things. We can be fully secure that nothing can do any real and lasting harm to us because Jesus has won. He is winning and he will win. He will win. And we can trust there's a bigger picture. There's bigger things at stake than just simply the temporary fleeting passing pressures of this world. They're fleeting. And that's what he's saying. And I want us to understand that as Peter would tell us, the fear of the Lord is to conquer every other fear. As Peter would say, the worst they can do to us is kill us. The worst they can do is kill the body. So like, that's kind of bad. But listen, Peter says, all that's going to do is bring us into the very best thing, which is in the presence of the Lord forever. And that to us, as we sit here in 21st century America, we're saying, well, that's kind of a radical thought, like dying for our faith. It's a radical thought. Listen, it's not radical for Peter. That's not radical at all for Peter. Peter's going to be martyred 12 to 18 months after writing this letter. He's going to die for his witness, his faith, his belief in Jesus. But why is he okay with this? Why can he write this, don't be troubled? Because he really, 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 really believed that this life is not all there is. 
He really says, I know Jesus rose from the dead. I know he conquered sin, death, the devil, and the grave. I walked with him. I ate with him. I gave him a high five. I hugged him. I know Jesus lives. And I know his kingdom is not of this world. I know greater things are yet to come. He knew it. He believed it. He can fully, with confidence and conviction, tell us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Christians, don't be afraid. We are not to be fearful or paralyzed by fear of this world. Let faith override all of those fears and trust the Lord and be faithful. Put that on your to-do list. Don't be afraid. Be less afraid. Don't be so troubled about the temporary things. Keep your eyes on Jesus and really remember, be reminded, be convinced. He is able to overcome all of this. He's given me the faith to do it. And nothing can separate me from his love. Be convinced of what the word of God has to say and what Jesus modeled for us. Don't be afraid. Verse 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil evil. The last point on our to-do list, Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now that's kind of an interesting way to put it, right? We, we often think about that God is sanctifying me, that God does the sanctifying work. And, and sanctification means set apart for holy use. So, so we're saying, well, well, God sanctifies me, but Peter very calculated, he says, no, and now you sanctify God in your heart. Set God apart in your hearts. And the best way to understand it is like this. Remember when we were going through the book of Exodus and we were spending time studying about the tabernacle. God gives Moses the instructions on how to build a tabernacle, a tent where God is going to dwell. His, his literal presence is going to dwell amongst his people in the very center of the camp in Israel. And there was no mistaking in that day. Like, no one was walking on the camp and saying, hey, whose tent is that over there? Like, oh no, we know that's the tabernacle of God. And how do we know that? Because everything had been sanctified. Everything had been set apart, washed, cleansed, made holy to be used for the purposes of God's presence showing up amongst his people. And you didn't just like bypass that. Say, I'm going to go in there wherever I want. I'm going to, pl- I'm going to walk right past that, that altar where a sacrifice needs to be made. No, you, you're going to do exactly what needs to be done because there's a sanctification. There's an order, right? It was all testifying of the presence of God dwells here. And where does the presence of God dwell today? Where is the tabernacle of God? It's not in, it's not in buildings made with human hands. It's in the very heart, the seat of the soul, the heart of every single believer. We are the temple of God. God's presence dwells inside of us, the Bible teaches us. In that light, just like that tabernacle is sanctified and set apart and obvious, that is where God is welcome, invited, enthroned. Peter says, us set apart a place in our hearts for God to dwell sanctify a place. You get rid of some baggage, get rid of some stones and some thistles and some rocks that are in the way, and you sanctify a place for God to enthrone your heart. Let it be as obvious as that tabernacle was. This place, again, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. This is a place where God is welcome. He gets to sit on the throne, and I want everybody to know that guy is devoted to Jesus. He's made room in his life for Jesus to rule and reign. I want Jesus to be my king and shepherd of everything. That's my heart's desire. And that's what Peter is going to sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts. Make room for God to take up residence, to dwell with you, to let him be the biggest chunk of your life, the, the, the main thing in all that we're doing. Set apart your heart for the Lord. That's what we want to do. It should be on our to-do list. It's something that we, we never want to forget. Sometimes our hearts can become crowded with all of these different things, but I want Jesus to be the main thing. I want Jesus to be my, my top priority. And as we do that, notice what he says. As we sanctify the Lord in our hearts, he says, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, that verse, that word defense is apologia, and it's where we get our word for apologetics. 
And this verse, I feel, has been taken way out of context in different time to take the, the, the idea of an apologetic to say that we need to have a systematic answer to defend the theology of our faith, right? We better have this two or three point the, theological thing to be able to give an apologetic. And that turns a lot of people off. And I'm not saying those things are bad. We should have those. But that's not what Peter's talking about here. Look at what Peter says again. What is the greatest defense? He says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you what for? For a reason for the hope that is in you. You know what Peter says? He says, what, what, Peter, what people really want to see, what people really want to know is if we live like this with a to-do list like this, they say, how do you have hope in such a difficult situation? How do you have hope after a difficult diagnosis? How do you still have hope when things are crumbling around you? How, where do you get your hope? Who is your hope? Where do you get this idea to love people and be tenderhearted and not lose your heart? Where do you get that? And we get to say, because Jesus is my God and King, because Jesus is everything he claims to be, because Jesus has forgiven me and loved me, died on a cross for me. We get to say, Jesus is my hope, my living hope. I get my hope and my strength and my motivation for everything he's called me to do because he did it for me first. It's a simple answer. It can be simple. Paul would say, I I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's not all talking. The, The greatest apologetic is not that argument. It's an unyielding, unshakable hope that is founded upon Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the fact that he is coming again. And where he is, he's preparing a place that where he is, we are going to be. It is a hope, Christians, that we want to let be shown as our defense. That's our greatest apologetic is a unshakable hope. Hope, not a hopelessness in a dark world. And I want to encourage you to let that be your testimony. Let that be what you leave in the wake behind, even in trials, even in difficulties, even in persecution. I have a living hope and my eyes are fixed upon Jesus. And I want to respond this way because this is my to-do list. Not because because I came up with them, but because this is what I've been called to do. So I want to encourage you to engage with these things. I want to run through one more time. This is is our to-do list. Number one, be harmonious. Be of one mind, the mind of Christ. Number two, have compassion. Be compassionate. Number three, be loving. Number four, be tender hearted. Number five, be courteous. Number six, don't return evil for evil, but bless. Number seven, refrain from speaking evil. Number eight, seek peace and pursue it. Number nine, fear not, do not be afraid. And number 10, sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts and lives. Let him as our living hope be our defense. Let that be what people see. I want to close out with just one more quick story. One day a preacher was out walking with his son and a man approached them and started talking to the preacher. At one point, the man asked the preacher his opinion of another man, a man that was at great odds with the preacher. But the preacher said something along the lines of, I think he's a good father. I think he's a hard worker and I know this, God has great things in store for him. And at that, the man left, but not longer, not long after the man went his own way, the father and the son were alone again. And the son looked up at his dad and said, dad, I thought that man hated you, spreads false rumors about you, accuses you for things you didn't do. He can't stand you. Why were you so complimentary towards him when you were asked what you thought of him? To which the preacher said, because son, I wasn't asked, nor am I concerned about his opinion towards me. I was asked what my opinion is towards him. And I love that because we do not have to respond to a harsh world in a harsh way. We've got a better example we can respond in a Christ-like way. We are called to be more like Jesus. And whether it's reciprocated or not, we have a fount that never runs dry. And all things that we need for life and godliness, it's all found in Jesus. We don't get our spring from the world. We get our spring. All of our springs are in Jesus. And he gives us what we need to live out what he's called us to live out. So let's agree with it. 
Let's let the word of God be the word of God and say, Father, I want to obey it. Help me obey it. Let's pray this in right now. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Father, we love your word. And we love that it's, it's living and it's active and it's eternal. It's timeless. This is every bit as much for us today as it was for your church in the first century AD. And so we ask as they would ask, Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us apply these things to our to-do list. Help us be more like you. Help us respond the way you would respond. Holy Spirit, as we read your word and we agree with your word, we, we now ask that you finish the work that you've started. Sow these things in. Give us the strength and the spirit of Christ to obey what you've called us to obey. Fill us to overflowing. Father, we love you and we want to represent you. We want to testify to a hopeless world. There's hope. His name is Jesus. Help us communicate what you're able to do by the words that we say, the words that we don't say, and the way that we live our lives. Please, God, be glorified through us. We need you. We have you. We trust you. We look to you. We love you. And we lift all this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you all. Have a great week. Keep pressing on and pressing into Jesus. 